When you think of the best parts of Half-Life 1, you probably think of chapters like Surface Tension, Blast Pit, or Questionable Ethics. But hardly anyone would have one of the Zen chapters bring to mind, and especially not Interloper. Today, I want to take a look at why that is. I want to know what Interloper's major failings are, and where its ambitions lay. And I want to know if Black Mesa did it any better. Interloper is arguably one of the most important chapters in the storyline of Half-Life 1, and possibly in the entire Half-Life series. It's by far the longest of the Zen chapters. It has the first glimpses of the Vortigaunt's true nature, hinting at their friendlier disposition in later games. It contains a lot, the majority even, of the world-building for the strange place that is Zen. It's got a brilliant title too. For those who don't know, the definition of interloper is a person who becomes involved in a place or situation where they are not wanted or are considered not to belong, which perfectly describes Gordon Freeman's situation in this chapter. And yet, no one really likes this one. I don't even like it that much. But I am fascinated by it. It's clear that the entirety of the Zen portion of Half-Life was rushed and significantly less polished than the rest of the game. Gabe Newell once called it one of his biggest regrets. Interloper is probably the worst example of that. Zen, the chapter, is the shortest in the game and it's just some janky but rather inoffensive platforming with a confusing puzzle at the end. Gonarch's Lair is a functional, if bland, boss battle. Nihilanth is a slightly less functional boss battle with some annoying mechanics, but it's still playable enough. But Interloper, pfft, it's kind of a mess. Confusing, convoluted level design with some of the most irritating enemies in the game and no cohesive focus or consistent theme at all. So let's go through the chapter together, map by map. After you defeat the Gonarch, you are teleported to an island similar to the one first seen when entering Zen. The platform underneath you crumbles and you are left to deal with the hostile Vortigaunts and alien controllers that are littered around. If you happen to be facing a certain way, you can see another platform housing a teleporter, which is the exit for this area. More likely though, you'll be too busy trying to kill all the enemies to notice it. Yet even this is fruitless, because they infinitely respawn. There are also pillars rising out of the ground, and poor looking things opening and closing everywhere. The intended path here is to find this cave at the back of the island, break this mesh stuff, ride this pillar up, gradually jump down the platforms, and then ride one of the alien craft, yes that is what the manta ray are called, to the teleporter. You could alternatively jump on one of the alien craft from the hill over here, or launch yourself out of the poor things to get onto them, but going through the cave is the obvious solution. Well, none of these paths are particularly obvious, but the cave seems to have had the most attention put into it. So what are the biggest problems here? Well, for starters, the level design is not especially good. The cave doesn't draw attention to itself at all, and I've watched many people get confused and stuck at this section, sometimes brute forcing their way onto the alien craft and missing out on the cave entirely. The platforming is truly at its nadir here. I'm a lot more sympathetic than most to Half-Life 1's platforming, but I can't really defend this. It's a retread of the floating platforms from the chapter Zen, but with flying enemies constantly shooting energy balls at you. Speaking of the enemies, you have to deal with hostile Vortigaunt's controllers while you do everything, including the tedious platforming 100 feet in the air. The controllers are very annoying to fight against when you have such little room to dodge their energy balls. I won't go as far as saying that they're poorly designed enemies, but this just isn't the right way to use them. The Vortigaunt's also don't work since most of the area here is open terrain. They work really well in tight spaces with lots of nooks and crannies, like the Black Mesa Research Facility. The only way to dodge their attacks is to break line of sight, and you don't have many ways to do that here. Basically, you can't avoid Vortigaunts when you're on the ground, and you can't avoid controllers when you're in the sky. About the only thing this area does well is encapsulate the title of the chapter, because you definitely feel unwanted here. Aside from that, it feels completely disconnected from the rest of Interloper, and Zen as a whole. Once you go through the teleporter, you arrive in a dark cave. I don't think that Zen being a series of completely disparate islands is an inherently bad idea, but it does seem at odds with the design philosophy of the first 80% of the game. That creative decision is not unique to Interloper, however, so I won't dwell on it too much. 
This map is significantly better than the last, and possibly the best zen section of the entire game, although it still feels underdeveloped. Right outside the cave, for instance, is apparently a stealth section, where alerting the alien grunts sets off an alarm that calls in controllers and additional grunts. I doubt you even knew you could use stealth here, and I wouldn't have known either if it weren't for this video by Marfidimus Blackimus, which you should check out by the way. It's a neat idea, but it is completely unexplained. Previous stealth sections, like the silo and blast pit, had an NPC alert you of the opportunity. Here, there is literally nothing. This area also has the first non-hostile Vortigons in the game, with an interesting bit of environmental storytelling as they seem to work on these machines while the grunts supervise them from atop these hills. You'd be forgiven for not noticing though, because nothing draws attention to this. Your first assumption is likely that these are still enemies, as they have been for the entire rest of the game, and will attack you and you need to shoot first. Compare this to the introduction of the military in We've Got Hostiles. You enter this room from a single entrance and a scripted sequence plays out. Notice how the scientist starts running down the stairs as you come in the room, drawing your eyes to him. You watch him approach the marine and get gunned down. This all happens from above, unless you start running down the stairs, which are laid out in a zigzag pattern to slow you down if you try to do so. Basically, you are shown that marines are hostile, all from the safety of this catwalk, before you have to fight them. Now, in this section in Interloper, you can approach these Vortigons from a variety of angles, and you have been trained throughout the game to kill them. So, unless you already play very slowly and cautiously with a keen eye, you likely won't notice what's going on. Not to mention that it's hard to get near to them without alerting the grunts, who will attack you. It also doesn't help that directly next to these passive Vortigons, inside this cave, are Vortigons that are always hostile, so you end up getting mixed messages at best. But this is the only major failure I see with this section. Otherwise, it utilizes the gameplay loop and pacing seen commonly in the Earthbound chapters, and merely adapts it to an alien environment. The tentacles and the gargantua are repurposed to be more common enemies in the boss status they were previously awarded. The tentacles work well as environmental obstacles that make Zen feel like a harsher place without relying on the overwhelming attacks of the controllers. And it is very satisfying to have the upper hand on the gargantua for once, as you can easily outmaneuver and kill it with the gluon gun. There is a decent amount of cover and the enemies don't constantly respawn, nor are the skies dominated by controllers. Exploration is rewarded with health, suit charge, and ammo. There's not much platforming, and the level design is relatively straightforward and up to a similar standard as the Earthbound sections. All in all, a good showing with some unmatched ambition in fleshing out the alien hierarchy and the role of the Vortigaunts. Once you go through another teleporter, you arrive indoors, which is certainly unusual for Zen. Walking through the hallway and into the strange alien factory, there's a big problem straight away. This is the first time the game properly shows you that the Vortigaunts aren't necessarily hostile. And by properly, I mean they aren't surrounded by grunts, and the scenario isn't set up like an obvious combat encounter. That being said, the only way you'll realize these Vortigaunts aren't hostile is if you happen to hold your fire for a few seconds when you enter the room. And that's not really your natural inclination. In fact, I've seen lots of players come into this room and start blasting without a second thought. If you are a bit cautious and refrain from shooting, then this revelation is genuinely intriguing, but that's a pretty big if. After this, there are no other opportunities to see that Vortigaunts can be passive, which is a major failing in this chapter of storytelling. This is a vital plot point going into Half-Life 2, and while that game clarifies things pretty well, it doesn't excuse the half-hearted attempt at storytelling here. This is also where these healing pods are first introduced, although this one is tucked in a corner and its purpose is not entirely clear, especially with how slowly it heals you. To be fair, this is a problem with the healing pools that appeared earlier in Zen 2. You can sometimes see a Vortigaunt go in one to heal itself, but it would be better to emphasize its purpose to the player. On a more positive note, the setting here works well as a contrast to the previous outdoor areas, and provides some nice environmental storytelling about what the aliens are actually spending all their time in Zen doing. The architecture feels properly alien, with these gaseous light fixtures and strange elevators. You get the sense that this is a slapdash operation. The way out of this room, through one of the conveyor belts, is reminiscent of some of the worst parts of residue processing, but you can find it with some light exploration, so it's not too egregious. The next map is where things really go downhill though. You're dropped into a pool of water and you have only a few seconds to get out before you're crushed by a falling barrel. Once you get out, you realize that the Vortigaunts are suddenly hostile again, assuming you even realized they were passive before, and there's no clear reason for it. The presence of the controllers, and considering they appear in the previous room only when you attack the Vortigaunts, implies that they are the heads of the operation and force the Vortigaunts to attack you, but that's a lot of connections to draw in the heat of the moment. The level design here is really contrived. The way up to the first floor is this tiny little elevator that just looks like decor and is very easy to miss. 
You then have to snake your way through these hallways, dealing with controllers and vorticons along the way, which make for an incredibly annoying combination. You then have to use some of these pillars to get up to the next floor, which are at least telegraphed as moving objects. From here, there's a branching path. You can go down this small hallway which is blocked with a barrel at the end, or go around on this walkway and ignore the barrel. I think there's a huge missed opportunity here. All of the barrels previously seen have been indestructible, whereas this barrel is the first one you can break. The only thing indicating a difference is a change in color, which isn't incredibly obvious among all these alien objects. These destructible barrels contain alien grunts, which reveal that this facility is being used to either create or transport these soldiers. So it would be great if the only way to get through this area was to destroy this barrel and ensure every player actually sees what the barrels contain. Otherwise, it is entirely possible for a player to fight and maneuver through this whole section without destroying a single barrel. I mean, it is also somewhat likely you'll accidentally destroy a barrel at some point, or assume you have to break these ones to get through the door, which you don't, but it's evidently not a deliberate design decision. I suspect the developers intended you to destroy these barrels to progress, but you can easily long jump on top of them with the long jump module, which I might add has not been required since the first few minutes of Zen. You then have to go into this alien vent, which actually looks pretty cool with the red lighting and floating particles, before descending into what is easily the worst part of the chapter. You drop into this massive room full of walkways and elevators with a chasm in the center. The first thing you'll probably notice is the overwhelming amount of enemies. Vortigaunts will likely start hitting you before you even have a chance to get to cover. This isn't like the finely crafted climactic battles of surface tension, despite this being the last hurrah before the final boss. The exit point, a floating portal at the top of the chasm, is at least decently marked out, and all the elevators emphasize the upward movement of this section. Speaking of the elevators, they rotate as they go up and down. Not only does this make you nauseous and unable to hit anything while riding on them, it also makes shooting the Vortigaunts riding on them super difficult. The path through this level is honestly pretty straightforward, and the architecture, especially the walkways, is suitably alien. The only real complication here is the enemies, and they're just not fun to fight against. The controllers continuously spawn, and the Vortigaunts constantly hit you when you're trying to line up your shots on the controllers. At best, if you've played this game three dozen times like I have, this just becomes a tedious exercise in popping in and out of cover to shoot down the controllers, and then moving up to the next floor before they can respawn in time, taking out some Vortigaunts as you go. At worst, as I've seen many times, it's some frustrating trial and error where you try to survive on increasingly low health, waste lots of ammo killing the controllers, and hug cover like it's your mother dropping you off on the first day of kindergarten. There's also this weird side area that looks kind of cool, but still suffers from the constant bombardment of enemies. There's a strangely excessive amount of satchel charges to pick up in here, which are not even useful at this stage in the game, and there's not enough ammo and batteries to justify the excursion in here. I'll also mention that there are a lot of barrels in both the main chasm and this side room, and I assume most players will encounter a grunt coming out of one of them at some point, which at first seems to counter my point from earlier. But it's easy to get lost in the chaos of all this fighting, and not notice that the barrel just disappeared with a grunt standing in its place. Not to mention that this doesn't feel intentional. You might call this a lack of authorial intent. The earlier sections of the game went to great lengths to show players mechanics and story beats like this in a measured and gradual way, like the alien grunt in the glass tube in questionable ethics. This, especially in comparison, just feels rushed and unpolished. Back in the main area, you hopefully make it up to the portal on these horrible, awful elevators, and jump in, and not fall your death like I've seen some people do. Reflecting on this map, it feels simultaneously too simplistic and too chaotic. I'm not even convinced these enemies, the controllers, the vortigaunts, and the grunts, can work in the climactic battles that made the HECU such good foes. The alien grunts seem like the obvious replacements, but their AI doesn't have the same squad tactics, and the map design is very wide open, so they just don't work as well. Going into the final boss, what I assume to be the climax of Interloper, just feels confused. It lacks purpose, and as I keep saying, polish. Once you go through the portal, you end up in the last map of the chapter, which is just a short prelude to the final boss. You hear the ominous voice that has been following you since you got to Zen proclaiming itself to be the last. It's very atmospheric, as the previous ethereal skies of Zen have been replaced with a completely black void, and your ears are tickled by the ambient synth music. The floating platforms reflect the very beginning of Zen, but now much more sinister. The giant spiky portal on the largest platform is gorgeously designed. I love the red lighting and the blue and green gaseous lights coming out the sides, and the red sun particle effect in the middle is equally inviting and discomforting. 
You can also hear voices of scientists from the beginning of the game as you get nearer to the portal, adding another layer of intrigue to the entire story. You step in, and the chapter is over. I honestly wouldn't change a single thing about this area. Absent gameplay, it's probably the best realized part of Zen aside from the G-Man confrontation. So we've talked about the goals of Enterloper. We've talked about his frequent failures and occasional successes. Now, I want to take a look at Black Mesa, the fan-made remake of Half-Life, to see where its interpretation of the chapter differs. Did it improve where Half-Life faltered? Did it create new problems? Major spoilers for Black Mesa ahead. I won't go through Black Mesa's Enterloper level by level like I did with Half-Life's, but rather I'll talk in broad strokes. I think the biggest improvement Black Mesa's Interloper makes over the original is its incorporation of the Vortigaunt story elements and is bringing those to the forefront. Black Mesa smartly ditches the first map that was basically unsalvageable and opens on a vista that looks similar to the second map. As a side note, one thing Black Mesa does really well with Zen is connected as one more or less continuous journey, unlike Half-Life 1 where it was made up of disparate areas connected only by teleporters. This makes the final part of the game feel more in tune with the Earthbound section stylistically, and gives you a constant sense of progress as you get closer to the big red portal in the sky. Anyway, you quickly get to the revelation, which is properly treated as a revelation here, that the Vortigaunts are actually slaves to the other alien forces. Not only is this shown with these great scripted sequences of the Grunts abusing them and the Vortigaunts accepting you into their village, but through the gameplay as well. When the controllers show up, there is a clear visual indication that they are forcing the Vortigaunts to attack you, and their naming as controllers finally makes sense, even if no one actually calls them that in the games. This is brilliant, as all the Vortigaunts you've seen on Earth are now recontextualized as acting against their will. Their eyes glowing red and their collars gleaming green are revealed to represent mind-controlled Vortigaunts. This literalizes what was implied in the Half-Life 1 factory sections, and is honestly one of Black Mesa's greatest triumphs in reimagining Zen and even Half-Life as a whole. The later areas in the factory continue this trend and utilize this gameplay concept as the Vortigaunts subtly aid you in destroying the factories and only attack you when the controllers control them. I do wish there were more scripted sequences with the Vortigaunts, especially in the factories since you can't interact with them much as it is, but I understand that implementing lots of scripted sequences can eat up development time. Another major success, I feel, is in the art direction. Black Mesa makes a deliberate attempt to diversify Zen. They don't use one single visual style for the border world, but instead show off lots of different biomes. Criticisms of Black Mesa Zen imitating an underwater seascape and straying too far from the bleakness of the original confound me because that's only really applicable to certain areas in the first chapter. As Zen goes on, the aesthetic moves away from lush, natural beauty and becomes increasingly desolate and grotesque, which is especially prevalent in the factory sections. The color scheme is red and brown, and the cavern walls all look very fleshy. The factories themselves feel like interlopers in some kind of large living being, as the metal platforms and equipment are seemingly stapled into the flesh walls and floors. It all feels very naturally unnatural, which is the best possible way the aesthetic of the original interloper could have been updated. Talking about the storytelling some more, the factory's purposes of manufacturing and transporting the alien grunts are deliberately made a lot clearer, and the areas where you see these processes are excellent set pieces that the original felt like it was lacking. I especially like this variant of the unarmored grunt, even if it isn't utilized particularly well in combat. I also like this bit toward the end, where you can see that the aliens have been collecting humans and human artifacts, just like the Black Mesa scientists were doing of Zen. It doesn't come from anything shown in the original game, but it feels like a logical story beat and helps develop the parallel between the Black Mesa research facility and the Zen factories. The game dedicates an appropriate amount of time to this small revelation, and doesn't dwell on it too much, which I appreciate. Gameplay, however, is where I feel things falter a bit. The bulk of this chapter is taken up by plug, platforming, and find the weak point to shoot puzzles. Admittedly, this makes more sense in the artificial factory setting here than it does in the outdoor nature-based settings of the chapter Zen, but it still feels incongruous with the earthbound parts of the game. In fact, Black Mesa goes out of its way to simplify puzzles from the original in the first 14 chapters, so it feels especially weird for the last few to rely on them so heavily. I like the general flow of destroying the factory, but the repetitive way you do it feels less natural than the other parts of the game, and very video gamey. Side note, video gamey, or gamey, describes game mechanics that are not particularly well integrated into a game world, and feel like they exist solely for gameplay and nothing more. One of Half-Life 1's greatest innovations was in creating a more immersive and cohesive world that integrated its mechanics naturally. It was, of course, not immune to gamey elements. Things like boss battles where you have to shoot the weak points to win, or levels that are only connected by teleporters are prime examples of gamey elements in Half-Life 1. 
I bring this up because this is a problem that comes up a lot in Black Mesa's interloper. Anyway, these bits where you have to use barrels to destroy barriers feel a lot more natural than all the plugs and laser jumping. To be fair, the plug puzzles are well tutorialized early in Zen, and the puzzles are constantly iterated upon to stay interesting, but it doesn't stop the entire element from feeling out of place from the rest of the game. These puzzle elements could be fun and feel satisfying, and I'll admit I did get a perverse sense of satisfaction from them on my second playthrough, but they would work a lot better in a game not entitled Black Mesa. The combat, I fear, fares worse. The alien grunt AI has clearly been upgraded to allow them fidelity in fights similar to the marines, but they have so much more health that they're less fun to fight against. They also still don't work together in squads like the marines do. Their dodges make shooting them seriously frustrating, unlike the Vortigons who are pretty weak enemies anyway and can have that kind of buff without feeling overpowered. The grunts aren't even used that much though. The controllers soon become the main enemy of the chapter and they never stop being the most annoying one to fight. This conveyor belt sequence in particular, with the epic music, seems like a botched attempt at a climactic moment that the original similarly failed at. The issues plaguing this one are that the controllers are still annoying to fight against and now they have the added ability of throwing barrels at you, which... Okay... But this whole section feels like it can't decide between being an epic fight or an epic chase, and ends up awkwardly in the middle. On one hand, you have to constantly shoot these hidden red things to progress forward, which is quite difficult when you're under fire from controllers and their flying grunt barrels. On the other hand, the level is clearly designed for forward momentum, and there's an awful lot of controllers if you're expected to stand somewhere and kill them all. Even if you're sprinting through the whole thing, it can be incredibly frustrating if you don't know where to go and are beat around senselessly by the armorless grunts. Also, the game starts giving you infinite ammo for the gluon gun at a certain point to really drill into your head that this is the climax of the game, but it goes on for far too long to justify that. The gluon gun is a novel weapon and the novelty seriously wears off when you're expected to rely on it for 30 plus minutes. It also hurts the final boss fight where you're suddenly going to have to switch back to using your entire arsenal to defeat it. One of the common criticisms that I do share is that Black Mesa's Zen is too long, especially Interloper. It rivals surface tension for the longest chapter in the game. Keep in mind that I've played through Interloper in both games before, but when I recorded a playthrough of each one, my Half-Life 1 playthrough was about 20 minutes, while my Black Mesa playthrough was nearly 2 hours. Now there's a lot of fat that could be trimmed throughout Black Mesa's rendition, like these sections where you have to dodge lasers while riding on top of barrels, for instance. But the most egregious part, in my mind, is the third to last and second to last maps of the chapter. The first of these is the final conveyor belt section in the factory, and it is completely, utterly redundant. Nothing in this map is new or even fun. You have to make your way through these conveyor belts to get to the top of the room, but you've been doing that for like an hour at this point. In addition, the game does this thing where you have to go through three similar gauntlets to unlock a final door, which is repeated from a section earlier in the chapter's end, which felt a bit pointless there, but now feels like outright filler. Each of these gauntlets involves going through very gamey and repetitive laser dodging, and find the weak point to shoot sections, and fighting controllers with force fields, as if controllers couldn't be more annoying. To get rid of the force fields, you have to shoot out these crystals, which are very artificially placed in these, and I really hate to keep using this word, gamey cubic enclosures, that are only open from one side. They've been art passed to look a lot nicer than they did in the 1.0 release, but it doesn't make the mechanic feel any less lame. I understand it may be telegraphing the way you destroy the Nihilans force field later on, but it's a pretty obvious solution when you get to that boss fight, and didn't need this much setup. There's no new story to tell here, and you're just repeating previous gameplay encounters that now feel increasingly stale. I can't help but think that cutting out this entire map would improve the chapter's pacing immensely. If you did cut it out, you could also keep the climactic momentum from the conveyor belt chase slash fight going into the elevator showdown. And now I'm going to talk about the elevator showdown. This is clearly meant to be the big finale to this chapter and the last hurrah before the final boss that Half-Life 1 sorely lacked. But it's just not very good. It's meant to feel epic with the grandiose and admittedly superb music and all the shields you have to destroy, but it rings hollow. Not even to mention the performance hit that takes the wind out of your sails, this section feels exhausting at the end of a long and exhausting chapter. The design of using your super gun to destroy the weak points to defeat the enemies while trying not to lose all your health is not particularly inspired, and I hate to sound like a purist, but it doesn't really feel like Half-Life. Sure, Half-Life does fall victim to this sort of boring, find the weak points fight design with things like the Gun Arc and the Nihilanth, and Half-Life 2 has some hold the fort sections, but especially at its best, the series tries to push the envelope, and it never forces you to use a single laser weapon to fight off waves of a single enemy type for this long. It never feels this gamey. Like, surely you can come up with something more creative than this. Also, when the music calms down and you finally think it's over, just for the elevator to go back down for one final fight, it's frankly groan inducing. Removing that part alone would make this elevator section a lot more bearable. The final map where you finally reach the red portal is gorgeous though. 
About the best graphical update I could hope for, even if it goes for more epic and menacing than downright sinister. Overall, I think Black Mesa's Interloper comes out slightly ahead of Half-Life's Interloper, although there's not much of a challenge there. Despite some pretty big shortcomings and a fatal flaw in going on far too long, it's clearly had a lot of passion and effort poured into it, and the storytelling and art direction do a lot of heavy lifting. The various gameplay mechanics and the puzzle elements used are better than nothing, even if they feel like they're in the wrong game. Whereas Half-Life's Interloper feels like the scraps of a much better meal, Black Mesa's Interloper feels like an overwhelming amount of admittedly well-prepared mashed potatoes. And that concludes my analysis of the Half-Life chapter Interloper. I hope you enjoyed my thoughts, and if you have any of your own, I'd be glad to hear them in the comments. Whether you want to talk about the games, compliment the video, or tell me how wrong I am about everything I just said, leave a comment. I don't plan on doing a series about every single Half-Life chapter, but if the response to this is positive, then I may consider doing videos for a few others. Let me know. And consider subscribing if you would like to see more scripted videos like this on Half-Life or any other game. Otherwise, thank you for watching.